Uh, uh, general introduction of uh, earthquake physics and uh, in particular in theoretical modeling for earthquakes. Uh, it requires uh, friction law acting on the fault surface. So to know the friction law of earthquake fault is an essential tool in understanding earthquakes. So uh, for that purpose, uh, we need to know uh, rock friction properties. So the, there have been many experiments on the frictional properties of uh, rocks. And uh, uh, I showed this uh, figure yesterday, uh, but I'm going to explain this again very b b briefly. So um, <coughs> this is just a steady state friction coefficient as a function of uh, the slip velocities. Here the unit is uh, uh, meter per second. So um, at the uh, largest, well, the, at the fastest slip, it is uh, uh, almost one meter per second, which is as fast as the maximum slip, uh, maximum speed of uh, earthquake fault during earthquakes. So we need, we don't need to investigate this region. So the maximum velocity that we need to investigate is this range. And the uh, lower limit of the slip velocities might be a circular motion of uh, the uh, continental plate or oceanic plate. So this uh, should be the velocity of uh, the plate motion. And this is uh, usually a several centimeter per, per year. Too close. Uh, thank you. So the plate motion is several uh, centimeters per year. That corresponds to 10, 10 to the minus 10th uh, meter per second. So it spans almost uh, 10 orders of magnitude in the slip velocities. But uh, surprisingly, at uh, uh, lower velocity region, we have a very good phenomenology, or uh, we have a good empirical law that can describe the frictional properties of logs in a, a wide range of slip velocities. So uh, this is a subject of uh, today's talk. So we're going to explain what kind of empirical law has been known for this quasi-static slip uh, between two rock interfaces. So um, during earthquake, this uh, high slip velocity becomes also important, and generally uh, friction uh, decreases very drastically at high velocities, uh, but uh, as you can see, the data are so scattered, uh, we don't have a good phenomenological law for this region. Uh, for this region. So uh, now uh, geologists and rock experimentalists are working hard to find out empirical laws for this region. But, uh, so <coughs> I don't uh, e explain this high velocity region uh, during uh, uh, this school. So we're going to see uh, what kind of uh, empirical law has been known for this. Mm. So uh, this is a bit older compilation of uh, rock, fr uh, rock friction experiment. And uh, again, the vertical axis is uh, steady state dynamic friction coefficient. And the uh, horizontal axis is uh, uh, slip velocities. 
uh, in the unit of uh, microns per second. So here it is one micron per second, and this is a millimeter per second. Usually, uh, if the slip velocities are larger than this, then we could no longer e expect the same phenomenology. But in here, we can expect the robust tendency for the behaviors of friction coefficient. Um, yeah, this work uh, involves uh, some kind of rock sp species that I cannot re remember now. But uh, the common tendency is that the friction coefficient has a negative tendency, a negative dependence with respect to the slip velocities. But the change of the friction coefficient is very small. For example, if the slip velocities increase by two orders of magnitude, then the change in the friction coefficient is like uh, uh, second digits, uh, like 0.02 or 0.01. So the dependence is very, very small. And actually, uh, because this horizontal axis is uh, logarithmic and the uh, vertical axis is linear, we could uh, see that this is a straight line. So that uh, it means that the steady state friction coefficient as a function of slip velocities can be described by this uh, empirical fitting of the data. Here, this mu star is just a constant uh, that can be regarded as the reference state uh, friction coefficient. And uh, the correspondingly, uh, this V star is uh, reference slip velocities. So this just means uh, at slip velocity V star, then uh, steady state friction coefficient is mu star. And the change of the friction coefficient from uh, V star is described by this uh, logarithmic term. So this means, uh, and uh, usually this log uh, means the, the common Logarithm. So if the slip velocity is, is 10 times larger, then uh, the change of the friction coefficient is just uh, alpha. And usually this alpha is very small. Uh, small like uh, uh, it becomes, a, it has only the third digits. And uh, Usually, uh, this alpha can be either negative or positive, depending on the experimental conditions or the details of rock specimen or composition of uh, minerals. So, uh, so far, there is uh, uh, no clear understanding how this alpha is de determined. But, uh, uh, we can regard this alpha is independent of slip velocities, so that uh, dependence uh, can be regarded as logarithmic. And uh, also, uh, this does not state. <laughs> this does not say <laughs> anything about the absolute value of this. Uh, steady state friction coefficient. It just uh, uh, describes the change from uh, a reference state. Uh, so, but uh, uh, empirically, uh, in this kind of uh, uh, quasi static slip, the absolute value of the friction coefficient takes uh, a certain value ranging from 0.6 to 0.8. Uh, 
and uh, that is insensitive to rock species or temperature. Yes. So this is a steady state. And in addition to steady state, we also uh, uh, know the transient behavior of the friction coefficient. And, in, and what, what uh, people did in obtaining this kind of behavior uh, is like this. First, uh, one realizes a steady state at uh, some constant slip velocities. Here, the uh, slip velocity is 10 microns per second. And uh, this is the friction coefficient. And uh, it uh, seems like the system reaches a steady state. And uh, after a while, uh, after, at, at a certain moment, we change the slip velocity instantaneously. Here, uh, the slip velocity is changed from 10 microns per second to 1 microns per second in a stepwise manner. And uh, right after the velocity change, the friction coefficient decreases like this. OK. Is that uh -huh. An artifact of the way the experiments are performed. Like, for instance, when you uh, abruptly change the velocity, it may be that the machine characteristics will not keep up with the. Exactly. Yeah, that's also the very important point. So, it generally depends on the stiffness of the machine. And, uh, yeah, one can control the stiffness of the machines and found that uh, uh, this jump is not an artifact of uh, the nature of uh, experimental facilities. So this kind of jump is very universal behavior and, and rock friction. So, and after this uh, sudden change of the friction coefficient, there exists a slow relaxation process towards a new steady state that corresponds to slower slip velocity. And here we reached a new steady state. And uh, next time we change the slip velocity in a stepwise manner. But uh, here we increase the slip velocities from uh, one micron per second to 10 micron per second. And uh, again, uh, the friction coefficient has, uh, uh, shows an instantaneous response. And for this time, this uh, instantaneous response is increasing. Uh, while uh, it, here, the instantaneous response is negative. So if we uh, decrease the three velocities, the instantaneous uh, response is negative. While uh, increasing the three velocities, the instantaneous response is positive. And also, uh, after this instantaneous response, we also observe a slow relaxation again. And uh, this experiment is taken uh, uh, from granite with uh, uh, 15 MPa normal stress. Uh, but. Uh, uh, this uh, kind of behavior is essentially the same for other kind of materials like uh, soda, lime, grass, and also acrylic uh, plastic. So uh, we could expect that uh, this kind of transient behaviors is uh, universal, uh, not only for rocks, but uh, can be valid also for 
grasses or plastic materials. And uh, usually, uh, this kind of relaxation process uh, can be regarded as the relaxation time. But in here, uh, the time is uh, uh, not important. Actually, uh, there exists a characteristic length scale over which the friction co coefficient uh, relaxes to a new steady state value. So uh, this defines the relaxation length. Uh, and uh, uh, in typical experiment, this length scale is on the order of uh, uh, microns. Okay. So this is uh, a typical behavior in the uh, tangent of the friction coefficient. So uh, we have the uh, transient behavior like this, and also the steady state behavior like this. So combining these two results, we are led to an uh, empirical law that can describe both the steady state and transient state. To do this, uh, we're going to do like this. So first, uh, the friction coefficient is assumed to depend on the slip velocities. And also, uh, we need an additional variable that uh, that is responsible for the transient process. So at a steady state, friction coefficient is just a function of the slip velocities. And to describe the transient behavior, we, we need this additional variable. And this variable uh, is called the state variable as uh, this is considered to describe the physical state of the frictional surface uh, during the sliding. And uh, uh, in here, we cannot describe the absolute value of the friction coefficient. So uh, we need a reference state which can be taken arbitrarily and describe the friction coefficient as the change from this reference state value. So um, this reference value for friction coefficient is taken for the steady state uh, friction coefficient at slip velocity V star. And using this reference state value, the friction coefficient at arbitrary state uh, can be described as the change from uh, this reference state. And this change depends on the slip velocity v in a logarithmic term. And also, for this state variable, we assume also the logarithmic term. So we have two, two terms, uh, each of which depends on uh, respectable variables, the slip velocity and uh, the state variable. So. Uh, these two terms uh, correspond to uh, this kind of uh, two uh, qualitatively different response. So we have an uh, instantaneous response uh, with respect to the change of slip velocities. And this instantaneous change corresponds to the first term. Because uh, this is a function of slip velocity, so if we change the slip velocity instantaneously, then uh, also the friction coefficient changes uh, instantaneously. And uh, we know that uh, if we increase the slip velocity, then the instantaneous response of the friction coefficient uh, is also positive. And so we can uh, 
deduce that this uh, non-dimensional number A is positive. So uh, this is the physical meaning of the first term. And how about this second term? Uh, second term is responsible for this kind of uh, uh, slow relaxation with respect to the uh, slip distance. And this second term describes a change from the peak of the instantaneous response to the uh, new steady state value. And uh, one can also infer that this uh, non-dimensional constant B is uh, positive, but uh, to do this, uh, we going to see more details about uh, this uh, functional form. So uh, also, it is important to note that uh, we uh, introduce some uh, unknown uh, additional variable, uh, the state variable theta. So uh, actually, the physical meaning of state variable is not very c clear until these days. So uh, for this lecture, I don't give a detailed discussion for the state variables. But uh, at least to describe the friction coefficient uh, empirically, and, um, what we need is just uh, uh, time evolution law for this state variable. So uh, such that uh, this uh, relaxation process of theta can describe the, this kind of relaxation behavior observed in experiment. So uh, these two e equations are just uh, typical, well, uh, two most popular evolution laws for the state variable. And uh, this is a time derivative of theta, the state variable. And it has a constant term, which is unity here, and decreases uh, Linearly with respect to theta, and also the proportional coefficient is V over L. So, uh, yeah, this is called the aging law, which could be uh, the oldest <laughs> evolution law for this state variable. And the second popular <laughs> law is this form. Yeah, it is. Uh, uh, it does not have a constant term, so, but uh, it has. Uh, uh, it is proportional to the slip velocities, but also we have this logarithmic term. So the relaxation term uh, behavior is not a simple exponential behavior in this case. And these two laws have uh, uh, own uh, good points and also uh, some bad points uh, for each. But, but what is important here is that we have a characteristic length scale, uh, which is denoted by L. And over this uh, length scale, the friction coefficient uh, relaxes to a new steady state. And uh, yes, so uh, this length scale uh, comes into play uh, in a frictional behavior. And it is very important in the earthquake generation process as well. And the uh, steady state value for these uh, st st state variables is 
obtained by setting the left hand side uh, to be zero. So in, for each case, uh, the steady state is given by L over V, which gives uh, some time constant. Oh, sorry, it is not a, actually a constant because L is constant and V is just a controllable parameter in experiment. So this depends on the slip velocities. But this L uh, plays more fundamental role, uh, which is considered to be constant. So I'm going to explain the physical meaning in detail. But uh, at this moment, this length constant L uh, has been considered as the uh, typical lengths of the asperities. And also, I'm going, I have to explain what is asperities in case you don't know about it. So I'm going to also explain this. So together with this uh, evolution laws, which can be chosen uh, in accordance with uh, what kind of problem we are considering, we are led to an empirical law that can describe the behavior of friction coefficient, uh, both for steady state and transient state. So um, we have seen that uh, at a steady state, this state variable uh, takes uh, the value of L, L over V. So we can insert this value into here and then retain the steady state uh, behavior of the friction coefficient in terms of the logarithm of the slip velocities. And here, uh, this uh, proportional coefficient uh, reads A minus B. So um, d depending on the concrete values for A and B, this proportional coefficient can be either negative or positive, depending on the details of uh, rock species or experimental condition. So in the next slides, I'm going to briefly explain the physical meaning of uh, this empirical reflection law. Yeah, to see the physical meaning of this, uh, we're going to introduce first the concept of asperities, which are the patches of the real contact. And uh, to de derive this friction law, we need to assume uh, microscopic processes uh, that occur in at asperities. Actually, these are thermal activation process. Um, so we need to assume some constitutive laws uh, that arise from uh, atomistic processes. And uh, from this uh, constitutive law, uh, we can derive uh, this empirical law. But uh, for this time, it is only for a uh, steady state. For, for more general case, uh, I'm going to introduce some papers. <coughs> so probably you already know that uh, uh, nominally flat surface is actually uh, not uh, completely flat, but uh, it's uh, very rough uh, in the scale of uh, microns. Here, uh, just a blow up of uh, the such nominal, uh, nominally flat surface. So this unit is microns. So uh, this length is just uh, five microns, which is very small. And this is the height yeah. of uh, this surface. And, uh, which is, uh, uh, and this surface is 
very rough because uh, it uh, uh, amounts to 100 or even 200 microns if we uh, scan the <laughs> distance over 10 microns. So this is an a, a example for very rough surfaces. And actually this, is, uh, uh, this surface is made by a shear fracture. So it, it is very rare. Uh, it is very uh, rough. And this is more, uh, sorry, more flat than this. Uh, because here the horizontal axis is uh, uh, 500 microns, but the change in the height is only uh, 10 to 20 microns. So uh, this surface has been prepared for uh, uh, prepared by sharing uh, two I interfaces. So the, such a uh, rough uh, profile can be well during the uh, shear. And uh, the third example is uh, the smoothest uh, among these three. Uh, but uh, we can still see uh, some roughness on the order of several microns, uh, because it, it, it is uh, five micron. So, uh, but these surfaces uh, seems uh, flat. Uh, but if we look at the surface by eyes, so uh, the friction is actually uh, <laughs> like this. So we prepare two surfaces and uh, let this uh, upside down and then push them e each other like this. So uh, by putting these two p p uh, surfaces uh, into contact, uh, yeah, one can obviously uh, see that uh, uh, these surfaces cannot uh, touch completely, but uh, only a small portion of such surfaces are in contact. And uh, in experiment, such uh, uh, real contact area uh, can be directly seen. And such a uh, small portion of uh, the contact area is called the asperity. And here uh, we can do this kind of experiment. We have two transparent uh, rough surfaces and put them into contact. And uh, because this is transparent, uh, we can uh, inject light through this surface. And uh, for real contact area, uh, the light can go through. But uh, for this kind of uh, aperture, uh, the light is uh, diffracted or scattered. So in here, we can see a black region while at asperities, it is more uh, bright. Because this uh, scale is 15 microns, so the size of the patch is uh, like uh, 30 microns or something. In, in this way, we can uh, visualize the asperities, which are the uh, patches of real contact area. And uh, this is uh, uh, not uh, seen in the uh, original coloring. But what we did is like this. First, we prepare this kind of experimental facility and changing the normal st stress. 
And at each normal stress, we take a photo of the real contact area. Sir, we can image. Sorry? Previous slide. It says it's a pre can we look at it? It's not very clear what exactly is being uh decan Uh sorry, I don't remember exactly, but they need some calibration for this kind of uh, light image to so for the analysis of the surface? Uh -huh, uh -huh. So at the smallest normal stress, we have uh, less contact. But if we increase the normal stress, we have more and more uh, real contact area. And most of them are surrounding the, uh, those at lower <coughs> normal stress. But also we have new asperities uh, by increasing the normal stress. So uh, from here, you can see that the real contact area is much smaller than the apparent contact area, at least uh, in this uh, normal stress range. And actually, uh, these people, Dietrich and Kirgoa, found that the ratio of the real contact area to the apparent contact area is uh, almost uh, identical to the uh, normal stress applied on the surface uh, normalized by the yield stress of the materials. So uh, in these graphs, the uh, horizontal axis is the uh, normal stress divided by the yield stress of uh, the material. So they uh, showed four um, materials. Uh, this is quartz, calcite, glass, uh, uh, plastic. So for uh, each uh, material, the yield stress is uh, very different. But by normalizing the normal stress by the yield stress, and the vertical axis is the uh, percentage of the real contact area. And uh, it is <coughs> almost on the uh, same line, uh, which proves that uh, this relation. So this means that if the normal stress is 1% uh, of the yield stress of the material, then the real contact area is only 1% of the apparent normal area. Yes. This uh, real contact area, does it change with time? I mean, uh... Exactly. So that is also a very important point in uh, rock friction. So I'm going to come back to this point uh, later. So uh, by uh, using the fact that the uh, normal stress and also shear stress must be supported by this real contact areas, we can write down the formal expression for the friction force as the summation of the shear force at each asperities. So this index i uh, denotes uh, each asperities. And uh, this sigma i, sigma i is uh, shear stress. Shear stress on asperity i. And a i is the uh, area of asperity i. So that uh, area times uh, shear stress defines the force, actually the, actually the shear force acting on asperity i. And the total shear force is just a summation of uh, all asperities. So it's a kind of identity here for the friction force. So <coughs> uh, in general, this shear stress acting on asperities uh, may be different from asperity to asperity. 
But here, we just uh, uh, use the average value for each asperities and write uh, the average value of the shear stress at asperities as uh, sigma y. So this is the average value, and this delta sigma i is the deviation from the average value. So we just uh, write this as this. So uh, and th this is just a deformation, and uh, uh, yes. So if the if the surface is sufficiently macroscopic, the number of asperities are large. So uh, this uh, fluctuation term, actually the summation of fluctuation is the uh, order uh, square root n, where n is the total number of asperities, while uh, this average value is order n. So uh, for sufficiently uh, large surface, uh, we can disregard uh, the second term and uh, can consider only the first term. And also uh, another reason why we can neglect the second term is that uh, actually this deviation from the mean value is not uh, so large for if we interpret these asperities as uh, the grain boundaries. So in, um, of course, uh, in some grain boundaries having uh, lower grain boundary angles, the shear stress could depend on the uh, oh, 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 uh, slip direction relative to the crystallographic orientation. But uh, for most grain boundaries uh, that have a higher angle, such a oh, 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 Orientation dependence of the shear stress are uh, not so large, and more it is more or less isotropic. So that is uh, uh, also uh, another reason why we neglect this. So we proceed with this expression. So the macroscopic friction force can be described as like the average shear stress acting at asperities with uh, this uh, summation of the area of asperities. Here we just write a true, and a true is uh, just uh, defines the real contact area. And as the friction coefficient is defined by the friction force divided by the normal force. So uh, by using this, it is written like this. So uh, the, the numerator, it is uh, average shear stress at asperity. And also the denominator is the normal load divided by the real contact area. So it is regarded as the average normal stress acting on asperities. So uh, this quantity is uh, actually uh, macroscopic quantities, but uh, it is also regarded as the average <laughs> friction coefficient for uh, each asperities. So in that sense, uh, the detailed nature of the surface topography uh, does not really important in the absolute value of the friction coefficient, but uh, also the uh, average shear stress and uh, actual normal stress at asperities determines the absolute value of macroscopic friction coefficient. 
So if because we have this expression at asperities, uh, if we can assume a realistic constitutive law for each uh, quantities, then uh, we can uh, derive the friction law. So uh, we're going to assume two constitutive laws. The first one is for the shear stress. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, this real contact area can be regarded as a kind of grain boundaries. So usually the slip at the grain boundaries can be done with uh, some kind of thermal activation process. Like, so, uh, but uh, we don't assume a specific uh, homo process for the grain boundary slip, but just assume this kind of thermal activation law, um, which involves uh, the activation energy and the temperature Boltzmann constant and also activation volume. And uh, V0 is some um, uh, uh, intrinsic uh, velocity constant, uh, which can be regarded as the order of sound, sound velocity. So we assume this uh, microscopic constitutive law between the shear stress and uh, slip velocities. This is the first one. And the second one is for the area of asperities. So as Rajit asked, uh, <coughs> This asperity, yeah, the, the area of asperity is actually time dependent. And this, uh, generally, it increases as a function of time. And here, theta i denotes the time. And actually, the, this is a contact duration of asperity i. So if the contact Duration is longer, then the area of asperity is, is larger. And here, C is uh, no, uh, non dimensional constant, uh, which is uh, usually the order of uh, 10 to the minus second in most experiments. So, uh, this kind of uh, logarithmic time dependence of the contact area is directly observed in experiment using the transparent materials, as uh, I have shown before. What did you say? This is glass. And this is uh, uh, time that uh, Elapsed uh, from uh, from uh, uh, the two surfaces uh, bec become in co contact. So it, because this is a log scale and the uh, whole vertical axis is normal scale, we can see that uh, this relation is logarithmic. And it should also depend on temperature. Yes, uh, usually if the temperature is high, then uh, this slope is also high. And you, you, usually such temperature dependence is uh, yeah, described by constant C. So the constant C may be an... Is this basically dependent on the mechanical properties, for instance, in the previous uh, slide? We talked about um, the... Um, uh, Yeah, um, actually this is a very uh, important point. 
So usually uh, the increase of the asperity area is uh, realized by uh, plastic deformation because at asperities, uh, stresses are concentrated. So this uh, rear contact area it itself uh, undergoes uh, flow. Uh. Okay, so that means the implication is the behavior. Yeah, uh, sort of, yeah. Department. Yes. Oh. Mm. And that strength that you put in, maybe that changes with time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm. It's not a fixed number. Maybe there's a mm. viscoplasticity. Yeah. 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 Which quantity is so time dependent? You, you had a quantity which was the normal stress divided by the instinct. Uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. So if it is viscoplastic, then that particular thing does not make too much sense. Ah, that's true. So you were saying that because this is time dependent, uh, right? Yes. Uh -huh. yeah. Exactly. Yep. <clears throat> but usually this uh, increase of uh, very, the slow. very small, very small, very small. Uh, exactly. So this is taken from the real experiment. Uh, at this time, the surface comes into contact with uh, no relative slip velocities. So that we can see the real contact area as a function of time. And as time goes by, uh, we see the, this real contact area uh, increases or spreading around itself like this. Since you have this picture, when the actual contact area starts percolating, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. does anything interesting happen? Because at the moment they are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we usually do experiments with uh, such a uh, area is only 1% of the total area. But uh, if we uh, can do experiment at much, much higher pressure, then such percolation could be observed. So uh, by using this fact, uh, we can assume that such a aging of asperities occurs for sliding asperities as well. And actually this is directly observed for sliding asperities by Dietrich and Kirgo. So we can assume that the real contact area is a function of time uh, with a small uh, non-dimensional number, or C. And this uh, time of contact of asperities uh, depends on the slip velocities like this. Here, L is the longitudinal size of the asperities, so that uh, if the top plate is moving at the slip velocity V, then the contact duration of asperity could be like this. So by inserting this here, then we can say that the real contact area is a decreasing function of uh, the slip velocities. And because the uh, real contact area is proportional to the friction force, this means that uh, for faster slip, the friction decreases. So uh, we have uh, some identity here, and also we assume two constitutive row for real contact area and uh, shear stress. By inserting these two quantities into this, we end up with a microscopic expression for the friction coefficient. And here we introduce a new notation, uh, capital P. And capital T is just the normal load divided by the real contact area. So it's a kind of uh, the uh, 
average normal stress acting on asperities. So and E1 is the active energy and omega is activation volume at the uh, sleeping asperities. And, uh, yes. So this should correspond to the empirical friction law. And by comparing these two uh, items, we can deduce the microscopic expression for these empirical parameters, A and B. Although uh, this B still has a new empirical parameter that is responsible for the time dependence of the uh, increase of the contact area. But here we have uh, an atomistic constants like activation energy and activation volume and the temperature. And uh, actually, this kind of expression uh, has been known uh, for more than 15 years ago and uh, verified in experiment. Here, uh, the A, the value of A itself can be measured or directly measured in experiment. And also temperature is controlled in experiment. So if we uh, use, uh, if we measure uh, the value of A by changing the temperature, we can see that uh, this A is roughly proportional to temperature. So that uh, this uh, relation is partially uh, verified. And also by, uh, and this P was the actual normal stress acting on asperities and it is regarded as the yield stress of uh, the material uh, due to the uh, stress concentration at the asperities. So uh, for th this is a value for most rocks, eight gigapascal. Then using uh, this, one can estimate the activation volume, which could be reasonable. Or, or <coughs> one cannot verify this value uh, because we do not specify the actual atomistic process for sleep. But it is not ridiculously large or ridiculously small. But at least we have uh, verified this proportionality between uh, this constant and temperature. And for uh, constant B, uh, unfortunately, we don't have any experimental validation to this state. So this is the, uh, also, uh, this gives the absolute value for the friction coefficient. So uh, if we use uh, this 8 GPA and this activation volume for this value, uh, we can uh, calculate the absolute value for the friction coefficient. Uh, as a function of the activation energy. And here, the horizontal axis is uh, the activation volume, also the activation energy. And this is the uh, friction coefficient. As I mentioned, the value of friction coefficient uh, is typically uh, around this value for most experiment. And uh, that uh, can be a constraint for the activation energy. So for this <laughs> expression to give a reasonable value for the friction coefficient, then uh, this activation energy must be uh, within this range, which is uh, around this value. And this is uh, uh, about 150, to 201 kilojoule per mole. And uh, what is interesting is that uh, this activation energy would be insensitive to rock species. And most rock, for most rocks, 
these values are more or less uh, similar. So this is also a very interesting point to investigate the frictional properties from a, a microscopic viewpoint. So uh, I'm almost running out of time. And, uh, yes. <coughs> So uh, here we have derived the uh, friction law uh, from a microscopic point of view. But uh, notice that uh, this is only for the steady state. Uh, for more general derivation, including the transient state, uh, you can defer to this uh, paper in archive. Okay, it's uh, time, and uh, that's it for today. <coughs> yes. For instance, in metals, when this, uh, two surfaces are subjected to contact, and where is that? Sometimes self welding can occur. I'm sorry. Self welding. Welding between the two surfaces oh. can occur. Oh. That would be like some no, even uh, as long as the outside layer is removed, even at uh, 400, 350, 400 degrees Celsius, metals can get better. Mm. Uh, uh, when we talk about the transient behavior, the stick slip process, mm -hmm. could that be a possible? Uh, uh, is that possible in the first place in rocks, such as? Um, Slip, I mean, self sort of the large layers. Uh, so, some venting process that's Yeah. Yeah, but some sticking has to have. Yeah. Metals, two metal surfaces. Fresh, totally devoid of oxide, really stick to each other. Mm -hmm. Right? Is there some similar which can happen? I don't know the interactions among metals. See, the two we are having huge pressures. Yeah, usually in rock experiments, we do uh, very thick samples so that the bending takes a lot of uh, force. So it is unlikely with uh, a sample with that, uh, such, thick, uh, such thickness. And if we do experiments for thin rock, then bending could uh, break the samples because it is very brittle. So uh, yeah, to directly observe such bending is difficult in a rock experiment. And you have asperities. Uh -huh. Very high. Uh -huh. And because of that, there can be fresh surfaces that are exposed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And two fresh surfaces, I'm wondering whether they can adhere in. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. Will lubricants change this picture considerably? That's true. We have the oxygen on the networks of water. That's true. Uh -huh. so Lubricants may play a very important role, of course, but at least uh, laboratory scale, even if the lubricants are on the surface, uh, but it usually does not affect the uh, detail process at uh, the at here. But uh, such lubricants or interstitial materials uh, can reduce the normal pressure on the surface. For example, uh, if uh, there is a significant frictional heat produced by the shear, then the water may be uh, vaporized to increase uh, the internal pressure and then reduce the normal stress acting on rocks. 
So uh, that kind of mechanism uh, is, is, of course, hypothesis in a real earthquake force. But, but some people believe that such process uh, actually uh, happening during earthquakes. Mm. Okay. So we, we take a break now and come back at 11:15:20, and mm. then Laura.